Hello everyone. So in this session, we are going to understand about insulin resistance and what is it that we can do to reverse it. In our studio today, we have Danielle. Danielle is a functional nutritionist who herself struggled with PCOS. Uh, welcome, Danielle. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Great. So let's just understand what insulin resistance means. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would love to share my story about my health history and kind of what insulin resistance sort of the role that it played with my own health. So basically, I was a pretty sick kid. I always had ear infections and strep throat and a pretty bad immune system. And so that meant I needed to take a lot of antibiotics. I ate the standard American diet. And that really means that I ate a lot of processed carbohydrates. I had a lot of, um, you know, breakfast cereal and pancakes and waffles and bread. And, and of course, I was always eating low fat because I was a product of the 80s and 90s. So everything was low fat in that era. So not a lot of good healthy fats for us. And I uh, got older and I was in college and I got really bad asthma and allergies and sinus issues. And I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And at that point, I was working in a nursing home. And at the same time that I was going through all my medical stuff, I saw people around me just suffering with all sorts of diagnoses and they had tons of medications. And meanwhile, they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s. And I was in my 20s and I was still on quite a few prescription medications. I was giving myself five allergy injections in the stomach every few days. And because I was just allergic to so many things and I was like, what the heck is gonna happen to me when I'm this age? Like, I'm just gonna end up like this. And I just said to myself, like, no, I'm, I'm not gonna let this happen. This doesn't feel natural. There's something wrong with this picture. And I just didn't believe that we didn't have any control over this. And so at that time I found um, the paleo diet and I read a book by Rob Wolf called The Paleo Diet Solution. And it was all basically talking about eating real food. So eating meats and vegetables and nuts and fruits and seeds and you know things that come from the earth, um, eggs and fish and all that and getting rid of this processed food these bad uh inflammatory oils and i switched my diet and everything i had going on got better i got rid of my allergies i got off all my medications i never had asthma again um i just i felt like i wanted to scream this information from the rooftops it was so important it was so amazing but then my hormones started to go crazy because I had a really stressful year. I went through a breakup, I moved, and I was just really struggling with uh, hormone symptoms. And so for me, that looked like I lost my menstrual cycle. I was having really bad acne. And at first it was tied to my cycles, but then it was all the time. And then I was feeling a lot of fatigue. I was like sleeping all through the morning. And normally, like I'm an early bird, I wake up very early. And I and I think I mentioned I lost my cycle and then I was gaining weight that I couldn't lose. And I didn't know what was going on. And then I found out I had what's called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is basically just a collection of symptoms. And they include the ones that I mentioned where women don't ovulate some times they don't get their periods or they're very late. Um, some other women lose hair from the top of their head and also grow facial hair. I luckily didn't have those symptoms, but many women do. And I tried really hard to fix my PCOS because I'm like, I already healed myself with my diet once, I wanna do it again. So I was trying really hard to heal my PCOS and, <clears throat> and everything I read was like, get rid of, uh, processed sugar. I'm like, I don't eat processed sugar. You know, that's the good check. It's like, get rid of dairy and gluten. I'm like, I already did. You know, they're like, eat real food. I'm like, I do. So I felt like I was already doing everything right, but I couldn't make a dent in my symptoms. I was not losing weight. If anything, I felt like everyone would be around me would be like eating cookies and I would just walk by the cookies and gain weight. Like I was gaining all their weight. I didn't know. <laughs> it felt like my body was rebelling on me. And I, like I said, I couldn't make a dent in it. And then one day I heard someone talking and they said, PCOS is like the diabetes of the ovaries. And I was like, what, what are you, 
what do you mean diabetes? Mm -hmm. So at that time, the only thing I knew about diabetes was that it had something to do with blood sugar and something to do with like amputations because I worked in the, in the nursing home and a lot of my patients had who had diabetes had amputations. That's all I knew about it. And it was something that in all the research that I had done about nutrition and how to heal myself, it was this big gaping hole around blood sugar because I always said to myself, well, I don't have diabetes, so that's not relevant for me. It doesn't matter. Like mm -hmm. I don't have diabetes, so I don't need to pay attention to this. And I couldn't have been more wrong because what I didn't realize was that the insulin resistance that I was experiencing that I didn't know about, it was actually driving my PCOS. So the PCOS ended up being a manifestation of insulin resistance for me. And so <clears throat> when we talk about insulin resistance, we know that insulin goes hand in hand with blood sugar. So what that basically means is that when we eat anything with carbohydrates in it, or we have sugar, it gets digested and goes into our bloodstream, all that sugar or glucose. Mm -hmm. And so insulin, if we have a functioning pancreas, if we don't have type one diabetes, our pancreas senses the rise in blood sugar, and it will emit this hormone called insulin. And insulin is like a little lock. So it goes onto the cells of our body. There's every single cell in our body has receptors for insulin. So it will hook into the cell and sort of like open this port. And now the glucose can go inside and the glucose or sugar is used as fuel for our cells. So insulin is necessary to get the sugar out of the blood to use for fuel. So insulin resistance is basically when either there's already too many insulin already in the cell. It's like, we're full. There's no more receptors left. The cell is full, no occupancy by like, I can't, I can't take you. But also there develops this thing called resistance. And so I explain resistance, like, let's say I'm listening to my headphones and it's so noisy outside. They start mowing the lawn. So I turn up my volume and then there's a truck and it, it more noise and traffic. I'm like, Oh, let me just turn up the volume a little bit. So now I'm listening to my music and someone comes to the door, I, I pause my music, I, I answer them, I put my headphones back on, I press play, what's gonna happen? It's gonna be like, oh, that's so loud, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't loud before, but now it feels loud because my ears had already developed resistance to that stimulus. Mm -hmm. Same thing if you put on a shirt and it has like a tag on it and it's so itchy, it's like, oh, this tag is like bothering me. In a minute, you don't feel it anymore, right? Because again, we have that resistance. So mm -hmm. our body develops resistance to all sorts of things very quickly. So all of those things, those two examples I gave you, it happens quickly. So when we're eating a lot of foods that spike blood sugar all the time, we're always increasing our insulin. And so when insulin is in the blood for a long time, that's when we start to develop resistance. It's almost like they're knocking on the door. It's like, dude, you were just here. Like, I don't want any more. So they're starting to ignore it. And they're starting to ignore the signal of insulin. And so now you have this sugar floating in the blood that can't get into the cells of the body. So now the cells are like, we have no energy. We feel like we're starving over here. Yet the energy is all around them. They just can't access it. So people with insulin resistance might end up having high blood sugar, but feeling really tired and hungry all the time because they feel hungry because their cells are starving because they can't get the glucose inside. The other thing that can cause insulin resistance is toxic vegetable oils. So I did not name them this. Someone's like, why are you calling them vegetable oils when they're not made out of vegetables? I'm like, well, I didn't name them. So let's just get that out of the way. So these are seed oils like canola, soybean, safflower, sunflower, cottonseed, corn oil, rice bran, and grapeseed oil. Um, these oils and the other uh, name for canola oil outside of the United States and Canada is known. It's also known as rapeseed oil. Doesn't sound very good, does it? Um, so <laughs> this, these oils are super inflammatory and toxic. And 
kind of like gunk up the receptors on the cell. So now the insulin can't get in that cell either. So these oils directly cause insulin resistance. And these are the oils that are very much promoted in mainstream society. Like if you Google what are healthy cooking oils, it will show you all those oils. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing to get out, even more so than sugar, those oils, because the sugar at least will get processed. But the but the oils, they become part of us, they every single fat that we eat becomes a part of us. And it becomes part of all our cell membranes. And so it's causing it, it turns into our fat, and then we get dysfunctional fat cells, it interrupts how our body actually burns its own fat for fuel. So getting rid of these toxic vegetable oils is going to be step number one, because they're directly causing the insulin resistance. So that's kind of in a nutshell. <laughs> wow. So, so the oils, the, what you said about oils is alarming because like you said, you know, you go on Google and you look at the healthy oils and these are the oils that, you know, I have seen myself. Oh, grapeseed oil, sunflower oil. So explain, just can you expand on it? Why they're toxic? Sure. So, um, it comes down to how they're, how they're made and processed. Mm -hmm. So in general, Nature doesn't make bad fats, only factories do. And if you look at the process of how these oils are made, most often they need to be heated up to very high temperatures, which if you know about oils, that is what damages them. That will make them rancid and become free radicals. So we don't wanna heat these oils, especially because these oils all contain a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is a long word for just saying they're very unstable fats. And that's why even if you put these fats in the refrigerator, they will not solidify. You, in general, you wanna cook with fats that are solid at room temperature because these are much more stable fats. Fats that are liquid um, at room temperature, they're much less stable. And so they don't have a higher to a high tolerance to heat and even light can damage them. So if you notice olive oil and avocado oil are in dark green containers, dark green glass bottles. Mm -hmm. But it's funny that the polyunsaturated fats, all these vegetable oils are in these clear plastic cartons just mm -hmm. sitting on the shelf being damaged by the light that they're exposed to. And then we heat them up on a pan. Mm -hmm. And then in restaurants, they reheat them over and over and over and over to fry foods in. Mm -hmm. So that's the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. um, but the process in which they're made, they need, um, so they're, they're also known as RBD oils, refined, mm -hmm. bleached, and deodorized. So mm -hmm. I recommend that everyone go onto YouTube and watch how canola oil is made. So you can see how gross and creepy this process is. So they, um, and yes, there are some of these oils that are expeller pressed. So that means that they're not heated up to get to this temperature, but it, they're still like pretty much just as bad. It's like, like dog poop or organic dog poop. Like it's just not good, <laughs> just not good, right? So, um, and I'm, I'm sorry to give you all that, that image, but yeah, so when they, extract these oils, they refine them, they bleach them, they use hexanes and industrial solvents, mm -hmm. and they degum them. I mean, this process is disgusting. And you can see that so much of it, it's like this, you know, this excess, whatever is sold as this commodity for, you know, livestock. And so it's like the big food companies, they're benefiting from these products because they're cheap and because in the money is in the refining. So if it just, you grow up from the ground, pick it and sell it, there's not a lot of money in that. But if you can do all these different processes to it and make money off all these different things. So that's a story for another day, but that's, there's a lot of money behind pushing these oils. So if you feel deceived, if you feel like, oh my goodness, this is not what I've been told, they're doing their job very well. Um, and they're not, you know, they want to keep customers. We, I won't, I won't go yeah, too far sure. into that, but yeah. So, um, and then the other thing is that they're loaded with polyunsaturated fatty acids, mostly omega-6s and the omega-6s are very, very inflammatory. Even canola oil, which they say they're like, oh, has a lot of omega-3s. It does have some omega-3s, but also a lot of omega-6s, which it's still not good, still not good. 
So, yeah. Okay. Well, I think this topic has to be a separate topic and always because it itself is a topic and we coming yeah. back to our insulin resistance, um, the signs of insulin resistance, you said low energy, right? That's one of the things you notice. What else happens? And of course, you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So insulin resistance, I really like people to think about it as a spectrum. So mm -hmm. it doesn't each individual cell in the body can become resistant to insulin. Mm -hmm. And so the more and more cells that become resistant, the more symptoms we're going to experience and the more severe those symptoms will be. So at first, it just starts off with and a lot of the insulin stuff is going to come out as like blood sugar symptoms. So these are kind of, I'm going to either say like, blood sugar dysregulation or insulin resistance, they're all they're like two sides of the same coin, but like this spectrum. So you might not you don't really feel anything with your insulin, you'll sort of see issues with your blood sugar and energy. Because remember, the insulin is responsible for where the blood sugar goes. So if it can't go anywhere, you'll have blood sugar symptoms. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, the first thing you might experience would be like, if a meal is delayed, or if um, you had to skip a meal for some reason, you might feel shaky, lightheaded, or dizzy. Uh, irritability and anxiety are very common. So a lot of people with blood sugar issues experience a lot of anxiety, um, difficulty concentrating, brain fog, feeling tired, weak, lethargic. Again, we're not getting all that energy, or we're very dependent on that sugar for energy. Um, potentially feeling nauseous. That's, it is common. Um, getting sweats or heart palpitations mm -hmm. and getting hangry instead of just hungry. So hunger shouldn't feel very intense. Hunger should feel like, oh, I could eat. That's how hunger should feel. And I didn't know that. I didn't experience that. Mm -hmm. um, my hunger, I would do things to prevent my hunger, but we can get into that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, and then having sugar, carbohydrate and starch cravings when your hunger feels very urgent. Mm -hmm. And then as the blood sugar dysregulation progresses and as this insulin resistance progresses, you might not be able to lose weight. That's a very clear sign of insulin resistance. When you can't lose weight, you have energy crashes before and after eating. You might have mood swings. Fasting would feel difficult or impossible. You have trouble with sleep. So you might have trouble falling asleep or you might have trouble staying asleep. You may wake up in the middle of the night with your heart pounding. You may get headaches. Mm -hmm. um, you might describe yourself as someone who has a slow metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, you might start to see other hormonal symptoms because mm -hmm. this is going to have this chain reaction. Mm -hmm. Insulin is a hormone, and so it affects all other hormones. And that's why I had PCOS, because if you increase insulin mm -hmm. in women, you're going to have an increase in testosterone. And that's sort of what my PCOS presentation was. Mm -hmm. In men, if you increase insulin, you actually increase estrogen. And so it can also give hormonal imbalances in men as well. And it's a really, really big cause for reduced fertility in both men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and then as insulin resistance really progresses, maybe where some doctor might tell you, but mm -hmm. still, doctors are just like, there's not very good tests for this. So mm -hmm. they just don't really know they'll test your fasting blood sugar, your A1C. And mm -hmm. It, that's not a good picture of what's going on. So you might be diagnosed with something like prediabetes or diabetes. You may have infertility, fatty liver, obesity, cardiovascular issues, joint issues, um, uh, the fatigue getting worse, uh, poor memory. So Alzheimer's is now being called type three diabetes. So that's something that's, that's scary, but it's something it's kind of empowering because <clears throat> we feel like we can't, you know, prevent Alzheimer's, but it's like, if you take control of your blood sugar and insulin, you may be able to. So that's, that's a really empowering message. And then in general, you'll find that on lab tests, you may have poor cholesterol uh, numbers. That's a sign of insulin resistance, having cardiovascular issues like hypertension, a very clear sign of insulin resistance, mm -hmm. and then um, worsening A1C and blood glucose numbers. And that could be if they're too high or too low. So a lot of people don't have blood sugar that's too high, their blood sugar keeps dropping low and keeps mm -hmm. crashing. That's also just another um, sort of place on this spectrum of insulin resistance is that you might have a presentation where at first your blood sugar keeps crashing, you can't get it to mm -hmm. 
to stay up. And what's happening there is that the insulin resistance is blocking your body from burning its own fat efficiently. So one of the things that insulin does, remember, is that we, it tells the body to store fat, store mm -hmm. energy, store sugar, store, store, store. Mm -hmm. So we can't possibly be in a fat storage mode mm -hmm. at the same time we're in a fat burning mode. Mm -hmm. So the main takeaway is that when insulin levels are present in the blood, mm -hmm. the, it's, the body is saying store fat. It can't burn it. Mm -hmm. So all this insulin is around and you eat and it's just your blood sugar is going to either tank, it's going to give you too much insulin or it's not going to be enough. So it's definitely insulin issues that are affecting that as well. So those are some signs. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, that's a, that's a very uh, detailed description. Thank you so much. Do you think we Thank should you. continue our, uh, as a part two session of reversal because we are at 20 minutes and we don't want to do too much so that people don't understand what's going on. And uh, we, we do uh, the second session of, how do we fix it? That's the part, right? Uh, should, do you want to do it now or do you want to do it some other time? Um, I'm happy to do it now just for a few minutes. I can give people a few tips. Yeah. Please go ahead then. How do we, now how do we get on the journey of fixing it? Yeah, absolutely. So the main thing we want to do is think about not spiking our blood sugar. So one of the best things you can do is get, if you have access to a, um, oh, my microwave, microphone's blocking it. This is a continuous, oh. continuous glucose monitor. And so I can just test my blood sugar and see what it is. And it gives me these, um, these beautiful graphs of what my blood sugar is doing. So right now my blood sugar is 92. I just had lunch. It's still in a really good range. You can see that my blood sugar has been pretty stable all day. It doesn't spike all the way up. So um, what would be dangerous is if the blood sugar is spiking up. In general, there's not necessarily a number we want it to stay below. What Over 140 is gonna be inflammatory for the body. But for most people staying even under that number in a tighter range is gonna feel much better in their body. So we want our blood sugar to be in a nice tight range. You can also go to Walmart or uh, CVS or something and buy a finger prick meter to get to know what's happening with your blood sugar. So after that, we want to make sure that our blood sugar is not spiking up. So we wanna take out foods that really, really spike our blood sugar. So these would be things like, especially flour, obviously sugar, um, refined carbohydrates, ultra processed foods. Think about like French fries and um, bread and cupcakes and cookies and all these foods. Those are pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. um, we also talked about the vegetable oils. So we want to get those foods out. And then we want to look at if we're looking at like real food carbohydrates, things like mm -hmm. potatoes, corn, sweet potatoes, high, mangoes, bananas, oatmeal, rice, even though these are all real foods, they mm -hmm. all contain a ton of carbohydrates. And so lowering some of those carbohydrates is mm -hmm. really, really important. So step one would be start eating real food, right? So eat mm -hmm. the real foods, <clears throat> get out those vegetable oils would be step two, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we also want to think about now we want to lower the amount of carbohydrates we eat. Mm -hmm. And there's a few little hacks that we can sort of employ to make sure that our blood sugar is not spiking as much. So one of the things we can do is simply just save our carbohydrates for last. And mm -hmm. so if you're eating a meal that is um, chicken, vegetables and rice, you want to eat it in that that order, like eat the chicken and vegetables first and save the rice for last. Mm -hmm. Then you can work on slowly lowering the quantity of rice and you can use your blood sugar meter to tell you like, okay, if I have more than an eighth of a cup of rice, my blood sugar is spiking. So maybe that's not even a good good choice of food. So maybe we could think about something else. We also want to avoid having naked carbs. So this would just be a carbohydrate by itself. So like chips or an apple or you know, a handful of um, like cookies or grapes or something like that. We want to make sure that our food choices always come with a protein and a fat because that's going to help to lower the response of the of the sugar. The other thing is that the more processed the carbohydrate, the more it will spike your sugar. So having rice is better than having a rice cake. Having an apple is better than having apple juice. Having a grape is 
better than raisins. Um, mm -hmm. So all of those little things, potato is better than a chip. So that processing just kind of condenses all that sugar. And so it spikes us much more. And then the same thing goes for flour. So anything made into a flour, besides mm -hmm. like an almond flour, because that comes from a nut, it's very like spiky, I call it. Like it will just shoot your blood sugar up. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing we wanna think about is how many times a day we're eating. This is a really big one. Mm -hmm. So if you can lower the amount of times you eat to only three times a day, and this is for most people, it's not like we eat three meals and three snacks, um, even though that's what they tell us to do. That's mm -hmm. not helpful information. That is information that was given to us. Thank you to uh, like from the snack companies, you know, mm -hmm. like eat healthy snacks all the time to keep your metabolism going. Mm -hmm. Actually, what that, that's doing is blocking our metabolism. It's blocking mm -hmm. the fat burning. Mm -hmm. So we want to not eat six times a day. And Actually, there's been a study where they found out how many times like just average people are putting something with calories in their mouth in a day. Mm -hmm. And it was like 17 times. So, mm -hmm. so many of us are just grazing. We'll grab some coffee and it has some sort of, you know, creamer or something in it. And like, you know, just have a drink of this or have a little bite of this. And then, you know, I'm cooking, I'm preparing. And then I just, you know, throw a few vegetables in my mouth. Like, that noticing how many times a day you eat is going to be huge and profound for your insulin because it's going to allow the insulin to come down between meals. It's also going to help digestion. Mm -hmm. But we want to just eat the, those three times a day. Some people like to play with intermittent fasting, and that's great as well. But mm -hmm. if you can just get yourself to the three times a day, it's going to do wonders for your blood sugar. And then you would think about kind of closing that eating window so you're not eating all hours of the day. So those are some tips just to get started. And then I just wanted to add one more thing. So we mentioned the oils and fats that are really bad, but adding in healthy fats is really what's going to help us start to burn fat for fuel. So we, if we're lowering the carbohydrates, we have to raise another fuel source. And that fuel source is fat. And fat has the least amount of effect on our insulin levels. So you can eat healthy fats and it's not gonna touch your insulin levels, it's actually gonna help. It's like the log in the fire. So think about fat as a log in the fire. You, you finally get the log lit and that will be burning for hours. Mm -hmm. But think about carbohydrates as more like the kindling, the sticks. Mm -hmm. We put that on the fire, it burns hot and fast, and then it's done. So if we are just eating carbohydrates, we're going to have to eat all the time. Mm -hmm. But if we can give ourselves lots of healthy fats like grass-fed butter, ghee, avocados, um, olives, olive oil, um, coconut, animal fats, egg yolks, all these foods, and then fatty meats, you know, get eat the fattier cuts of meats and, and fish. All of those things are going to help to stabilize your blood sugar and give your body the fuel that it needs to help carry it on. So a lot of people are like, okay, I get it. I need to lower my carbohydrates, mm -hmm. but then they don't increase their fat. So they're eating like chicken breast and vegetables and they're starving and they're like, I don't see any benefit. Mm -hmm. So make sure you increase those healthy fats. That's a huge, huge thing that I want to leave you with. So, wow, that's a lot of amazing, amazing information. <laughs> yeah. uh, so tell us one more thing before we wrap up and I hate to wrap up this kind of a session. It's, it's so <laughs> a wealth of information is which oil is good. Okay. That's what I want us to know. Yeah. So, um, the, oils that I recommend are avocado oil, but by chosen foods brand, because other ones I think uh, are rancid based on a study, extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, and all of those are for either cold, well, no, the coconut oil you can cook with because mm -hmm. that's um, solid at room temperature. Mm -hmm. The other ones I recommend for maybe some low heat cooking, mm -hmm. but mostly for cold uses. So like salad dressings, drizzling on your vegetables. And then some other oils may be okay, like, like a flaxseed oil, walnut oil, uh, like a macadamia nut oil, but do not heat those. Those shouldn't be heated. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the fats that I recommend to cook with are the ones that are solid at room temperature. So things like ghee, butter, 
animal fats like tallow, lard, um, as long as it's coming from a very healthy animal, that's mm -hmm. how you know you're getting a good fat. And these fats also come with lots of nutrients. Like there's vitamin D in lard. Like we think about lard and we're like, oh, that, that sounds bad, but it's actually really nutritious. So mm -hmm. it's something that's really good. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Amazing, My amazing pleasure. information. Amazing yeah. information. So much useful information that all of us can start implementing, you know, literally from day one, like day one is today. So yeah. thank you so much, Daniel, for being with us. I hope uh, to all the viewers, it helps you. If you have any questions, you're welcome to put it in the comment. I know we're in the middle of the day today. People would be watching it afterwards as well. But um, mm -hmm. thank you again, Danielle, for helping us understand blood sugar in so much detail. Really yeah, really absolutely. Can I tell people um, how to con like find me if they want more information? Yeah, they they have your information, or you can put it in the comment. I, I okay. you know you know when we uh, this would be replayed on our Facebook. Sure, you're welcome yeah. to put it in the comment. Then that way people would know exactly how to contact you. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I also have um, a podcast called Unlock the Sugar Shackles. Okay. So if you want to listen more, <laughs> you could find it there. You find that podcast yeah. anywhere. Unlock so. the Sugar Shackles. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're welcome to put it in the comment. Yeah. That's Excellent. Fun. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. And okay. Bye.